So welcome. Welcome to Monday, March 1st. This is our class session. And I want to make sure I got the right paper in front of me. That's better. Monday, March 1st class session in our statistics class. And I got a couple of reminders for you. And then we'll get right into some interesting calculations. Now, uh, I did pre-write some things here because we're going to do some very specific calculations today. And it'll be faster than me writing and talking at the same time. But you don't have to copy what I've written down because remember you've got copies of this posted after class on our website. So if you want to, you don't have to rush to copy anything down that I've written on the paper already. So just a couple of reminders before we get started. Next week is Delta College's spring break. So uh, it sounds funny to say Delta College is spring break because you know the first reaction people have is, well, yeah, I'm at Delta College. And the problem is no, some of you are maybe dual enrolled high school students. Some of you are listening to this recording after your day in school. Some of you are visiting from other colleges or universities. So Delta College spring break does not naturally, naturally match the spring break if you're in another school. So the only thing that's happening next week is Delta College's spring break. And there are no class sessions or office hours during that week. So you can still email me a question if you have a question, if you're working on something, but I'm not going to be online in a class session or office hours. I'll take you past our website in a second just to show you what that looks like. But how does that affect your homework? So you have a homework due, number six. It was actually one problem because we cut short our discussion last week. You have a homework due by 11.59 on Tuesday, March 2nd, that's tomorrow. But during the spring break, you're not gonna hand in a homework. That would be pretty obnoxious of me. So I will post a new written homework for you Tuesday, tomorrow, but it won't be due until after you come back from spring break. So that'll be 11.59 Tuesday, March 16. So technically you have two weeks to work on that. Now there's only one problem in homework number six. Uh, there might be two problems or there might be three problems in homework number seven. I'm not trying to give you extra problems because you have more time to work. I'm rather saying I wanna catch up that space that we didn't complete last week. So we're averaging two problems a week. Also remember you're working on the Newton Alta assignments and I gave you a grade report updated with the amount you had completed to date for the second batch. But remember there's a recommended completion date for the third batch of the Newton Alta assignments. And that is Monday, March 15. And at that time, we are recommending you have the first 17 of those Newton Alta assignments completed. In the whole class, we have 30. So you got to pace yourself. You don't want to let it all come at the end. And you also get a benefit from doing those assignments because you're reinforcing what we're doing in class and helping to practice that. It's much easier to keep up with the class and the homework if you're keeping up with these Newton Alta assignments. So I'm not trying to create work for you over the spring break, the Delta College spring break, but if you have extra time because you're not doing our homework problems once a week, you might see if you can catch up on some of those Newton Alta assignments if you need to catch up. So try to keep on track with those. I'm going to go quickly to our website just to show you what everything looks like there and to show you a new feature. So let me share 
this website with you and go to that window and let me make sure we're all looking at the same thing yes we are whether you're here live or recorded so this is the basic page of my whole website if you want to find our course apart from the link you've probably already bookmarked you can go to semesters and then in the winter 2021 semester we're math 208 and I tried to clean up a little bit on our homepage, giving you the links to the questions and assignments, presentation, office hour links right away at the top. Made this presentation a little bit shorter, but here's our weekly schedule. So this is what I'm talking about. We're calling this week eight, week nine is spring break. And then we'll pick up in week 10 and 11 and then it'll be time for our next exam. I wanna show you something here in week eight, apart from our schedule, which we've got the first three sections filled out here and I'll fill out these sections from chapter nine later on tonight, probably. Notice the due dates for the homeworks, the written homework and the Alta homework. So you always can keep up to date on the weekly assessments list here. But I also posted a formula sheet for you. And I, you might remember, I mentioned this last week or maybe even the week before. We're starting to collect a lot of formulas and functions. You know, we've been collecting them all throughout the class. And in a face-to-face -face class on the exam, I said to you, I would provide a formula sheet for everybody on an exam so that everybody had the same formula sheet. Everybody had the same expectations and the same conditions. Here in this class, you're always with your book anyway. So I hadn't released a physical formula sheet, but I thought uh, it's time that I organize these formulas on one sheet of paper because otherwise you're often paging through your book. Now that's good practice, but it's time consuming. So here is a formula sheet for the formulas we're using to date, at least through the end of this week, we're going to add more. Now, the problem is it's not a formula sheet. If you carefully write down all the things we've used so far, it actually comes out to be about three pages. And I'll just show that to you briefly. I got to make sure. Okay, I gotta work on my home network to make sure I'm always displaying what I intend to display. Let me see if I can increase that. I cannot increase the size of that type too well here, but you could download this yourself and look at it. So I literally went from beginning to end and wrote down definitions of things or formulas of things we've used so far. Data set, data set with frequencies. I'm assuming I'm putting that data in order. I see some typos here and there. I'm missing a comma, but that's not a big deal yet. You know, what is a percentile? The kth percentile, here's the instructions for computing the kth percentile. And quartiles are just the 25th, the 50th, and 75th percentile, but you also know how to compute those. The range from the last data value to the first data value, that's where your data is. And remember, you've got for a box plot, first data value, first quartile, second quartile, which is the median, third quartile, and last value. Then the interquartile range, and for identifying potential outliers, you dip 1.5 times the interquartile range below Q1 and 1.5 times the interquartile range above Q1, above Q3, excuse me. Some people call that the lower fence and the upper fence. So I've used these formulas in other classes before and other statistics books. 
Then you got the idea of what is a population mean and a sample mean. Those are computed the same way. If the population has N elements in it, or if the sample has N elements in it. And if you're talking about a list where you have the frequencies of each data element, then you just sum up the frequencies to get the N. But standard deviation is different whether you're talking about the population standard deviation sigma or the sample standard deviation S. We'll see that difference today. So then, you know, I'm just skimming through these formulas. Population variance, sample variance, that's the square of the standard deviations. You know, we talked about basic probability. Probability of an event is always between zero and one. Probability of A or B is probability of A plus probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Conditional probability. We defined two special words called mutually exclusive and independent. And then we got into discrete random variables right away where you're summing all the probabilities and you get to one, like an experiment where you're rolling dice or drawing cards. And they also can present a mean and a standard deviation. And that is calculated in the same way mean and standard deviation were before, but now if we're using the word probability instead of frequency, I'll use P of X for probability of X instead of the frequency of X. Probability is relative frequency. So that makes these formulas a little bit simpler. The second formula here is a formula that you can execute quickly on your calculator, but we concentrated on writing it in a table in this first formula. Then we have the binomial distribution and the famous binomial coefficients, which you see in your Newton Alton assignments. We can also calculate the binomial distribution simply with the binomial probability distribution function built in the calculator. Binomial probability distribution has a very nice mean and standard deviation, relatively quick to calculate. You don't have to add up anything. And then we started talking last week about normal distributions, this fancy bell-shaped curve. Now, there's a formula for that fancy bell-shaped curve, but it's also built into your calculator, both that formula for that curve in a generic distribution of mean mu and standard deviation sigma, or what's called the standard normal distribution, which is centered on zero, mean zero standard deviation one. Standard normal distribution is valuable because it allows us to compare all distributions and to set expectations for how unusual something is. So that's why we define the z-score of a value in a normal distribution. And then last week, we did some visual things with the area under a normal distribution and area to the left or right representing probability that the value of a random variable is less than or less than or equal to a value. When you're talking about a continuous distribution, there's no difference between less than or less than or equal to because they'll represent the same area. Now today we're gonna get into setting up a use for the standard normal distribution, a very valuable use, predicting the mean of a population if we only have a sample. And so these formulas that I've written here now, starting at 21, these are things that we're gonna be talking about more today and this week. So you see that that's three pages and counting. I know that we're gonna add some more, essentially in the second half of the course, if you think about it, this is week eight, 16 weeks, counting spring break, we've gone to the halfway point now. I don't think I'm gonna add another three whole pages, but you know, could add several more formulas here. I thought it'd be nicer to have these on one 
or a couple sheets of paper instead of you thumbing through the book all the time you want to remember this. Maybe you'd like to add some formulas and you're welcome to do that on your paper or let me know and it's a great formula, I'll add it to our paper. Okay, so you will now find this on our website under handouts, formulas and functions. Okay, good. And we've got some Excel and Desmos things you can play with to help you visualize distributions that I showed you example last week. But that's the, that's the deal for the tour of the website today. So I'm gonna stop this sharing and go back to my paper. And I'm on my paper and I'm recording, so let's get going. So, like I said, I've pre-written some things just so I don't talk and write slowly, too slowly. But let's remember this idea from last week. There's a famous theorem called the central limit theorem that basically says, the larger the sample we take, the more accurately we can describe, describe a population. Now that's the English sentence and the central limit theorem is a math sentence. It's a sentence in statistics, but that's the idea. If you have a population of uh, all the drivers in Michigan and you wanted to make some prediction about all the drivers in Michigan, uh, how many points do they have on average in their license, you know, from moving violations? Uh, what's their mean insurance rate? What percentage of them are 50 years or older? See, that's statements about the whole population of drivers in Michigan, but it's very unlikely that you're gonna be able to survey all the drivers in Michigan. So you're going to take samples. Should you talk to 100 drivers? Should you talk to 500 drivers? Should you talk to 1,000 drivers in Michigan? You're probably going to talk to as many as you can, given the amount of time you have or the amount of money you have. You know, maybe it costs you something to physically survey these people. It certainly costs you time. But this is a key fact in statistics. It's called the central limit theorem. As you take larger and larger samples of some random variable X, the distribution of the sample means, and we'll give a demonstration of that in a second, will have the same mean as the original random variable, but it'll have a tighter and tighter, a smaller and smaller standard deviation. In fact, the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means will be equal to standard deviation of the whole population divided by the square root of the sample size. Last time we illustrated this with rolling dice, rolling one dice, rolling two dice and averaging them, rolling five dice and averaging them, rolling 10 dice and averaging them, or rolling 100 dice and averaging them. So how can we exploit this? Now, along the way, I'm gonna have to remind you what I mean by it. the distribution of the sample means. But right now for our arbitrary random variable, let's just think about some population we want to know about, like drivers in Michigan. Okay, so the consequences of the central limit theorem, what it's gonna allow us to do is it's gonna allow us to zero in on the mean, even if we don't know what the mean is by taking progressively larger and larger samples. Let's set up a kind of a simple question. What is the average age of driver in Michigan? Unless I get to the Secretary of State's office and get the records of every single driver in Michigan, which I'm probably not gonna be allowed. 
I can't calculate the average age, but I can certainly survey 100 or 200 drivers in Michigan and I can calculate their average age. And from their average age, can I make a prediction about the average age of the drivers in Michigan in general? And the answer is yes. Not only can I make a prediction, but the more drivers I sample, the tighter and tighter my sample mean will reflect the population mean. Smaller and smaller standard deviations means my sample mean is getting progressively guaranteed to be closer and closer to the truth, the average age of all drivers in Michigan. Another way I could state this is I can make reasonable predictions about the value of the population mean based on the sample mean. And this is the kicker, whether or not I know the standard deviation. So we've got two things I'd like to show you today. If I know the standard deviation, I can construct an estimate in one fashion, but I can construct an estimate in a very similar fashion, even if I don't know the spread of the ages of the drivers in Michigan. So simply from surveying drivers in Michigan, I can make an intelligent prediction about the average age of all the drivers. Okay. So I apologize. I don't mean like when someone is giving a presentation and they just read slides to you. I don't mean to be doing that, but I thought I could give a better explanation if I had some things written down ahead of time. Okay. So have you ever heard this word, confidence interval? Or maybe you've heard the word in a poll margin of error. When someone says, uh, we surveyed all the voters in the state and we believe this person is going to win the Senate race 57 to 43 with a margin of error of five points. Now, if they're right, if somebody has a lead of 57 to 43 and the error in their survey is only five points, well, you expect that person is going to guarantee to win because the lowest they could have is 52% and the highest they could have is 62%. That's called margin of error. A confidence interval is a different way to express a margin of error. And it doesn't have to be just about voters. It could be about age of drivers. And Confidence intervals, you have to be very careful when you construct them and interpret them. But once you understand what they mean, they can give you a lot of certainty, a lot of information that you can communicate to people about your sample and your population. So before I explain exactly what a confidence interval is, let's remember what we did last week. in a relatively hurried fashion, but this is a summation. This is a summary of what we did last week. Remember, we can calculate the area under a normal distribution or even the standard normal distribution between any two values with function built into our calculator called normal cumulative distribution function. So remember a normal distribution is like a bell-shaped curve and I didn't draw beautiful bell-shaped curves here, but <coughs> these will do. So if I have a bell-shaped curve with some mean mu and some standard deviation sigma, if I want to know the area under that curve to the left of B, that'll be the probability that that random variable's value is less than or equal to B or less than B, either way and you type that into your calculator by using the normal CDF function, putting in four values, starting point, ending point, mean, 
and standard deviation. Now, if I want all the way to the left of B, I want the starting point to be way back here, like minus infinity. You know, I want all the area under that curve. There's no minus infinity on my calculator. So I use a very large number, minus one times 10 to the 99th. That is minus one with 99 zeros. 99 zeros. So that's way, way, way down to the left. By that time, I think I should capture all the area under the curve. Also remember, you can find the area between any two specific points and two specific values of x by taking the area under the curve from a to b. That's the probability that the value of the random variables between A and B. And for that, you just put in the ordinary numbers A and B, and then mu and sigma. You could also calculate probability of the value of the random variable being bigger than the value A by taking the area under the curve to the right of A. And you could do that in two ways. You could either start at A and go forever, you know, one times 10 to the 99th power. Again, is one with 99 zeros. A very large number. And by that time, I've gone as far out as I need to go to capture all the area. Or I could take the area up to A and subtract that one from one. So the area that goes from the left up to A is this area here to the left of A. Remember the whole area is one. So the blue part plus the red part equals one. So if I wanna know the blue part, I could take one minus the red part. If I wanna know the blue area, I'll take one minus the red area. If I want to know the red area, I could take one minus the blue area. I could do it either way. But this concept of area and probability, that probability and area are the same thing in this picture. This is the key concept we need. So now let's talk about the confidence interval. Think of the confidence interval at first about people giving you the information in a political poll. Uh, this candidate has 57% of the vote, plus or minus 3%. That means that candidates got from 54 to 60% of the vote. That's an interval. And why is it an interval? Because until the elections run and done, nobody knows how much of the vote that that candidate has but someone's making a kind of a bold prediction. Within three percentage points, I'll tell you how many votes she has. It's between 54 and 60%. Is that a high confidence level or not so high? Well, it's all relative. If you make a prediction between 54 and 60%, but I make a prediction she's 57 percent support plus or minus one, then my interval is very tight between 56 and 58. Now, why should I be able to make a more accurate prediction than you? Am I more confident about the amount of support she has? Yeah, I must be more confident in some sense about the amount of support she has. Or maybe I've surveyed more people. In fact, if you think about it, the only way I could be confident is if I surveyed more people. So let's look at what that interval is and what it means to express confidence in that interval. So all confidence intervals are gonna look like this. You make an estimate, 
like 50% of the vote. And then you say your error is plus or minus 3%. And what does that give you? It gives you an interval from 54% to 60%. You're believing that when the votes are cast, her support is gonna be between 54 and 60%. So the first number, your prediction is the estimate and the error is, you know, how certain you are about this result. Now, there's some vocabulary associated with this estimate from a sample of a given size n is called a point estimate. In other words, that's the estimate you're making from that sample. You interviewed a thousand people and 57% of them supported this candidate. If you interviewed a different thousand people, maybe 58% supported the candidate, maybe 54% supported the candidate. Each one of those are estimates and they're naturally gonna be different every time you interview a different thousand people. But if you're interviewing a lot of people, all those estimates are gonna be close together. That's the central limit theorem. Typos here and there. The error estimate, the error is estimated with what we call an error bound. So in this example, I gave you 3% was the error bound. And by that, I mean, the error might be less, but I'm willing to express a certain amount of confidence that the error is going to be at worst 3%. That doesn't mean I'm always right, but it means that's the boundary I've set up for this situation, okay? Let's go on to the next page. So let's do a calculation where we don't know a population's mean, but we do know it's standard deviation. Excuse me, let me slide this on the screen. Let's do a first calculation where we don't know a population's mean, but we do know it's standard deviation. We don't know a distribution's mean, but we do know the distribution standard deviation. Remember, we use population distribution for the whole collection of people. It could be the population is all the drivers in Michigan, or it could be the distribution is, as the example we're about to do, the amount of time it takes to fill out your taxes. In the first case, all the drivers in Michigan we're using population to mean a group of people. That's the way you commonly use the word population in English. But in the second case, how long does it take to fill out your taxes? You could call that a population too, but the population is the number of hours it takes to fill out your taxes for everybody in you know, the US or in Michigan. Make sure I got everybody in here. Okay, so let's look at that standard deviation curve a little more closely. So I've got a distribution that certainly has a mean and a standard deviation, but I may not know what either one of them is. Let's assume I don't know the mean, but I do know the standard deviation. How could I set up a confidence interval for what the mean is? Well, I'm gonna take the distribution of sample means. And that means that I will just keep sampling a certain size population. And I know when I do that, that the bell-shaped curve gets tighter on the mean of the sampling distribution, which is also the mean of the original distribution. Now, every time I take a sample, 
do you see I get a sample here? I don't know if I get the actual mean, right? Maybe I just get sample values. But they're relatively tightly close to this sample mean here. And that means they're all going to be relatively close to the actual mean of the whole population. So how could I tell you how close I believe I am? This is what we're going to do. It's called a one minus alpha confidence interval for the population mean. And these are the technical terms. And then we'll do an example. So I'm going to set it up by replacing the population mean with a sample mean x bar. And I'm going to agree that I'm going to sample 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people, whatever is appropriate for the problem. You know, someone's going to tell you how big the sample you want to make. The EBM is the book's abbreviation for the error bound of the mean. What is the error I expect when I sample this many people? There's a formula for the error bound of the mean. It has got three pieces in it. It's got the square root of the sample size. Okay, I know that. Someone told me to sample 1,000 people or 100 people or 50 people. It's got the standard deviation of the population. Now, it's maybe not easy to read here because I'm writing small sometimes, but the whole population I called x, the random variable, and the distribution of the sample means I called x mean or x bar. These are the idea of sampling people and then taking the average of their age drivers in Michigan, or the average of the amount of time it takes 100 people to do their tax forms. This z alpha over 2 is called a critical value. It's the value with the area to the right of alpha over 2 under the standard normal distribution. And the alpha is called our error allowance. And one minus alpha is called our confidence level. So for example, if I want a 90% confidence level, 90% confidence, remember 90% is 0 0.90 decimal. That means one minus alpha is 0 0.90. So what is this alpha then? What did I subtract from one to get 0.9? I subtracted 0 0.10. So my error in that case is about 10%. I'm gonna admit or allow my error to be as much as 10%, you know, plus or minus. That means 5% error on one side, 5% error on the other side. That's my error allowance. And if my error allowance is 10%, then one minus 10%, 90%, what's that? That's the opposite of error. That's my confidence. My confidence, I am 90% confident in this prediction. Now let's do an actual problem from the book. And this problem is looking like one of the problems you're going to do in your written homework number seven. So what we have to do is calculate the confidence interval with this formula and tell you how to state it, interpret it, and explain what the confidence level means. So I want to pick out a problem from the book just so that we're on the same page. And the written homework I'm giving you this week has a problem from the book like it. It's very much like 98. So let's look at 97 from chapter eight. I have to switch to 
my screen and share this. I had the problem here picked out. And I got to find it. Okay, here we go. And let's make sure we're all reading the same thing. We're all reading the same thing. And let me try to make it large if I can. A little bit larger. Okay, so let's try this out. Suppose that an accounting firm wants to make a study to find out how much time is needed to complete someone's tax forms. You know, everybody's different. And I don't know whether you do your tax forms or you have someone help you, whether you have someone help you or not. Maybe your tax forms turn out to be really easy to fill out. Maybe they turn out to be complicated to fill out. So, you know, it could go anywhere from maybe an hour or two, maybe a half hour. It could go into, you know, many hours, many days. So what they did is they sampled 100 people randomly. And this is worth talking about right here. When I talk about sample and all the things that we're talking about now, these confidence intervals, everything we're going to talk about in the next several weeks, everything we're going to talk about for the rest of the course, I, I'm assuming I got a legitimate random sample, not just surveying 100 of my friends at Delta College. Maybe a lot of those people are younger, maybe they got part-time jobs, maybe their taxes are simpler. No, I'm gonna say I randomly survey people and that means I actively, carefully construct a random sample according to what we talked about at the beginning of the course. So let's say the tax firm did an honest random sample, but to emphasize that it's a true random sample, I'm gonna stop saying honest random sample, true random sample. I'm just gonna assume they did the random sample correctly. This is a random sample. They sampled 100 people and they found that the sample mean was 23.6 hours. They happen to know that for the population, there's a standard deviation of seven hours. You know, for the whole population, whatever it takes them to do their taxes, it's within plus or minus seven hours, one standard deviation. What does one standard deviation mean again? 68% of the people are within one standard deviation of mean. So we're assuming this population distribution is normal. It doesn't always have to be that way, but let's assume that the original population distribution is a bell-shaped curve. So let's just fill in some facts. We got to tell the difference between population parameters and sample statistics. What you calculate about the sample, those are called statistics. What the truth is about the population or what you know about the population, those are called what? Parameters. So I got to see if I can write on this in a handy way, what is the mean of the sample they took? Well, they said it right there, it's 23.6 hours. Uh, I can write on here. I don't know how big things go and I don't know how movable things go. And I got to experiment that, but uh, let's see if I can put, change the size of that box. I don't know how I can check the size of the text, but let's put the 23.6 right there. Okay, I was pretty close. What's the standard deviation of the whole population? Now remember, that's not the same as the standard deviation of the sample mean of distributions. But the whole population, we expect that the standard deviation is seven hours. Let me see if I can slide that over there. 
I didn't quite hit the target, but let's say 7.0 hours. At least you see me typing on there. What is the size of the sample I took? Again, that was provided for me straight up. Sampled 100 people. OK, it doesn't fit in there nicely, but it's reasonable. So can I make a guess about everyone's taxes from this 23.6 and from the standard deviation of population 7 and from the size of the people I interviewed? Yes, I can make a guess. Yes, I know it's probably not perfect. But can I give you a plus minus? Can I give you an error range? So first, they want to make sure you understand the difference between the random variables x and x bar. So what is x? What is the population that they're trying to study? x is the time needed to complete one person's taxes. What does that differ with X bar? X bar is the mean, is the distribution of the sample means. That means instead of interviewing one person and finding out how long it takes them, I'm gonna take a big clump of people, 100 people at a time. And I don't think I can type X bar easily in here, but I'll just say it. X bar is the distribution or the time needed, the average time needed to complete tax forms of 100 people. I'm going to slide this over here. There we go. So I had some control of the text. So X bar and X are two different things. I'm hoping that when I survey 100 people, I'll get a realistic picture of how long it takes everybody to do their tax forms. Now, which distribution are you going to use to construct the confidence interval? You always use the X bar, the distribution of sample means. Let's construct a 90% confidence interval. OK, so let's go back to our paper now. I'll come back to this page later, but let's go back to our paper and we'll come back to there later. So 90% confidence interval, get my pen going here. means I'm going to allow 10% error at most. That means my alpha is 0 0.10. And when I take the means right here, when I take my samples, I could some maybe someday I'll get way off here. That would be unusual because it doesn't happen too much, but it might. What does 10% error mean? It means I want to avoid this last 5% right here. Remember, 5% is 0 0.05. How likely is it that I can stay out of this bottom 5% and top 5%? Well, I think it's pretty likely that I could stay out of there because remember the distribution for X bar is tighter than the distribution for X. So I need to find this point right here called Z. Now remember not 0 0.10, but the place where 5% is above that point. I'm going to ask my calculator where
that point is in the standard normal distribution. So Z alpha over two, what's the Z score of alpha over two? What's the Z score? 0 0.05 for what Z would give me an area of less than 5%. On my calculator, and I can pull up my screen calculator. But I think I'll, yeah. Okay, I'll hold this one under the camera so I don't have to go to another screen. But that's under distribution. Normal cumulative distribution. And I want the lower bound to be what? I want the inverse normal here, excuse me. I want to know what number, inverse normal, what number would give me 5% of the area above or conversely 95% of the area below. So when I hit the inverse normal command, it says, what area do you wanna talk about? And you always give the area below. I want 95% of the area to be below with the mu of zero and the sigma of one. I'm calculating a Z value. I'm using the standard normal distribution. Now I paste and I get 1.6449. Excuse me, I lost my pen. This Z of 0 0.05 is 1.6449. Okay, so I've got one of my pieces in the error bound. Now, what's the standard deviation of the original sample, x? That was given to me as seven. And how many people did I survey? I surveyed, or they told me I surveyed 100 people. So now I can calculate my error bound. It is the 1.6449 times seven divided by the square root of 100, not 100, square root of 100. That's this formula right here. Now I'm just gonna type that into my calculator and and tell you what I got. I mean, I have this number 169449 right here. I could just multiply by seven and divide by square root of 10. I got 3.641. Just take 3.641. That's my error bound. Now, what was my estimate? What was my sample mean? That was given to me in the problem, it's 23.6. Now, I, you can decide how you wanna round off right here. I can do 3.641, 23.600. But now I'm gonna take the X bar minus EBM and the X bar plus EBM. And this is gonna give me an interval for how long I expect people's taxes to take. So let's do the plus one first. See, it's always easier. Add these two numbers, I get 26, 27, 241. I think 241 is a little excessive, you know, 27.2 hours, but let's keep the decimals. Now let's subtract, subtract 3.6, I get 20. So subtract the rest, I get 19, nine, five, nine. You can do that subtracting on your calculator. 23.6 minus that number we just had. 19.959 if I round up. So now what do I have? I have a decent estimate of how long it takes to do a general person's taxes, not just my estimate of the 
100 people, not just my sample, I could say for all the people, whatever population I'm examining, I think it's gonna take between 20 and 27 hours, let's not get rounding off too much, 19.95, that's 20.0 hours and 27.2 hours to do their taxes. You say, that's a pretty wide spread. And I say, yeah, but I got something going for me. I'm 90% confident. that that's where the mean could be. Now let's express this very carefully because I can't just say, I know the mean is in that interval. So let's come over here and look at that interval on my paper. So let's express this in English. This is how you would say this in English. We estimate with 90% confidence. What does that mean? I'm not totally certain, but we estimate with 90% confidence that the true amount of time it takes to fill out one person's tax forms is between, I'll go to the nearest tenth, 20.0 hours and 27.2 hours. That's how you would say the confidence interval in English. Do you want to have more confidence? Well, probably you'd have to expand the size of this interval to catch the true value. Do you want to have a very tight interval? If you have a very tight interval, I don't think you're gonna be as confident that you're gonna hit it. So do you understand that? Large interval. You know, if I make the target wider, I believe I have a much better chance of hitting it. Large interval is gonna naturally be associated with higher confidence. And what would a tight interval or a small interval mean? Let's say I wanna say that uh, it takes people on the average between 23 and 24 hours to do their taxes. Oh, that's a pretty sharp estimate. That's a pretty tight estimate, pretty small window. I don't think I can be absolutely certain I'm gonna win with that estimate, right? So a smaller interval means I would have a lower confidence. Okay, now remember smaller or larger interval depends on the size of the error bound that you calculate. And the confidence is not the alpha. Think of the alpha as your accepted error. Confidence is the one minus alpha. If you're gonna allow 5% error, that's the same thing as saying you're 95% sure. The one minus alpha is called the confidence level. Okay, 
I have to illustrate another style of doing this problem too, but I wanna point out something to you when we calculate the error bound for the mean. Remember the sigma X is the standard deviation of the original population. What's the standard deviation for just doing one person's taxes? And we were told in this problem that was seven hours. So the standard deviation, if I know this, if this number is fixed, then I can play with these three numbers. Do I want the error bound to get smaller? Well, let's interview a heck of a lot more people. And remember, I can only interview as much people as I have time or money, right? How about, do I want to have more confidence? What would more confidence mean? It means this Z value is gonna be higher, right? Think about that carefully. More confidence means I'm farther out on the tail. More confidence means the Z value is higher. So what's more confidence gonna bring me? Bigger error bound. Less confidence, smaller error bound. Less people, larger error bound. How about if I want to make the error bound smaller? I can make the error bound smaller either by making the Z smaller or the number of people larger. What I'm trying to say is if I know the sigma sub X, then I can control any one of these three things. by doing what? Changing the other two, manipulating, excuse me, let me get the paper on the screen nicely, by manipulating the other two or by just changing the other two. And he gives you examples of that in this problem 97. I'll let you finish the rest of the pieces in problem number 97 because I got to get to another distribution now. Okay, that was the first case. We do not know the population's mean, but we do know its standard deviation. Now let's think about it for a second. If you know the standard deviation, why don't you know the mean in the first place? In other words, it's probably unusual that you know the standard deviation, but you don't know the mean. So our second example would be what? What happens if we don't know the mean and we don't know the standard deviation? We have random variable X, And we don't know either one. That's a little more realistic, I think. Why should you know sigma of x if you don't know mu of x? So let's give you an example of this. The confidence interval is still going to be X bar sample mean minus an error bound. But the error bound is going to have to be calculated differently this time because I don't have sigma X. You might stay instead of Z alpha over two, 
times sigma x over n root. Why don't you use z alpha over two times the standard deviation of the sample? Now the problem is the standard deviation of the sample changes every time I take a sample. So that sample mean, that X mar might look a little bit different. This may not be a normal distribution. In fact, by experiment and experience, people have worked out that if I wanted to place the sample standard deviation in place of the population standard deviation, I do not have a normal distribution. But I have something that's very close to a normal, dis normal distribution. So we have to use a different distribution. It's called the T distribution. And it's also built into your calculator. It's baked into your calculator. It's kind of handy hanging the calculator into the camera. I agree sometimes. So right here, inverse T distribution, T probability density function, T cumulative density function. So here's the normal distribution is the first three on your distribution menu. <coughs> That's because they're important. The T distribution is almost just as important. You're gonna use this a lot too. So the next three on your list are from the T distribution. This has got a fancy or funny sounding name from the old days is called student's T distribution. And your book tells you the story about how this came about. And that is, there was someone at a brewery in Ireland who was trying to work out the correct recipe for beer, for the beer that they were producing. And, you know, in Ireland, England, they got different words for beer. I don't even know them all, but you hear words like Guinness, Stout, other things like that, that I'm just not familiar with completely. So this fellow was trying to do calculations with confidence intervals. And he noticed that in the standard way of doing the calculation with a confidence interval, his answer was okay, but sometimes a little bit off especially if he didn't have a large sample. And just making small numbers of batches of beer, of course he didn't have a large sample. So he worked out that the standard normal distribution doesn't completely apply, it's not perfectly accurate. He created another distribution called the T distribution. It came to be known as student's T distribution because when he wrote up his research, his beer research, he published it under a pseudonym, under a pen name called student. So it came to be known as student's T distribution. The T distribution is very much like normal distribution. It's very similar to the normal distribution. but it's a little bit flatter. And by a little bit flatter, I mean very, very little bit flatter. And so I'll show this to you on the calculator screen because then you may get a different, it's better than holding up my calculator in this case. The difference is so slight, it's hard to see. So let me go to my calculator screen coming over here and you can go to distribution. You can go not just to distribution, but to draw the distribution and let's do a normal distribution, but I don't wanna shade it. 
I well, I could shade it if I want to, but let's just have lower and upper be the same. Uh, it could be any number, but I'll take minus one times 10 to the 99th. Now let's do a standard normal distribution and draw it. Okay, now I did the right thing, but I've got a bad window here. Must have a window from a previous problem, right? So let's go to a standard window, number six. And let's turn off this stat plot, number one. Okay, now let's graph that normal distribution. Draw normal distribution. Uh, frankly, I could just go from one to one because that'll give me no area. Okay, try again. There's the normal distribution, but remember we're talking about probabilities, so it's very small in here. So we're gonna have to adjust our window again. X is okay, but you know, minus six to six might be fairer. Sorry, window, I got to use the minus key on the bottom, minus six to six, count by ones is fine, but let's go minus 0 0.1 to oh, 0 0.5, and let's count by 0 0.1 here, graph that. Oh, I got to redraw that distribution. So draw shade normal distribution just from one to one. There, it only draws it one at a time. There's my standard normal distribution. I put a little line at one. Okay, so you could ignore the line at one if you like. So how about, and there's no area from one to one, by the way. So let's draw now on top of here a T distribution. Let's shade the T distribution and let's go T distribution from one to one. But here I got to input a new number called the degrees of freedom. If the sample size is 10, the degrees of freedom is nine. If the sample size is 100, the degrees of freedom is 99. The degrees of freedom is a number one less than the sample size you took. Let's say I took a sample size of 10 people, then the degrees of freedom would be nine. What I want you to see when I draw this is how incredibly close they are. And if I could make this picture larger, I would. Let's try it. Yeah, do you see how incredibly close they are? Maybe I'll try to draw it again in red. Draw, T distribution but let me change the color to oh i got to put in the degrees of freedom nine let me change the color to red and graph it see that red thing is coming in and unless you're looking really close you say that's the same thing as normal distribution no it's not quite it's a little bit shorter just a hair shorter, and it's a little bit wider. There's more area out here in the tails. Now I can tell you this, as you get closer and closer to large sample size, the larger and larger the sample you take, the more close it gets to standard normal distribution. If you take a small sample size, you don't get quite to the standard normal distribution. If I drew another one with a really small sample size, which is kind of silly in a way because I rarely just sample two or three people. Let's say I sampled four people. So degrees of freedom is three. And let's color that one. What other colors do I got? Magenta, green, let's try green. Do you see it's not quite as tall and it's wider in the tails? The red and the green distributions are called student's T distribution. It is almost a standard normal distribution. It's a little bit shorter, a little bit wider. As you go on, 
if your n was 100, you'd have a hard time telling the difference. Let me draw one with 100, just so you can see that you can't tell the difference. One to one, let's say degrees of freedom, this time is pumped up to 99. And what color should I use? Uh, I don't know how well these different colors show up on your screen. How about yellow? No, that's not gonna show up. White, how about uh, magenta? Maybe that'll pop. Here comes the magenta one. If you look at it, it's almost perfectly drawing over the blue one, not quite. Okay, I don't think I can make this screen larger. That, well, make it slightly larger. So you can still construct, I'm gonna go back to my paper. You can still construct the confidence interval for the case where you don't know the population standard deviation, but instead of the normal distribution, you have to use this student's t distribution. And on your calculator, instead of inverse normal, you're gonna use the command inverse t. So the error bound here is gonna look like this. Not z alpha over two, but t alpha over two. The place in the t distribution where the area to the right is alpha over two. And the area on the other tail is the same. Then you multiply by not the standard deviation of the population because you don't have that. Multiply by the standard deviation of the sample divided by n. So let's take a very small sample and then we're gonna to have to call it quits today. Let's take a small problem from 8.2 and try it out. Uh, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. So here's a problem out of your book that I'll just share with you so that I can bring my calculator here too. Uh, I don't know how to share that nicely. Let's put it on the screen book. So this is page 460, this is try it number 8.9. So I'm going to share my book with you again, but just go backwards several pages, not 484, but let's go backwards to page 460. That's in the middle of the section somewhere, 472, 4, 67, I think I'm coming up on it. Here's page 462, 460, here we go. Let's look at this problem. A random sample of statistics students were asked to estimate the total number of hours they spent watching television in a week. Now, you're only gonna sample 15 people. Use the sample to construct a 98% confidence interval for the mean number of hours they took to watch TV. Let's arrange these people in order. This is, try it. And we can do this problem really quickly and then we'll get going. Move on to your other stuff today. And so since you've seen it and I've written this as page 460, I'm just gonna switch back to my paper and copy what I see on this page. I gotta find the page. So in order, these data is I got a zero, I got a one, I got a what? Ooh, a three, a couple, oh, I got a two, I got a three, I got a couple fours. That's five people. Another four, I got two fives, right? 
you might be looking at the book too, but I'm just looking at my book in front of me. Then what do I got? The one, oh, I got two ones, didn't I? Okay, got to be careful about that. That's why you make a stem and leaf plot. Uh, two ones, one, two, a zero. Somebody watch no TV. Uh, a two, three, two fours. I had three fours. Then I had two fives. Now I started to get into the big hitters. Somebody watched after that nine hours of television, 10 hours of television. I don't think that's that hard to do. Another person watched 10 hours of television. And then what else do we got going on here? A 14 and a 20. Let me see if I captured all 15 students. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That's right, I got all 15 students. So let's pop them into my calculator and calculate the mean and the standard deviation of the sample. So I go statistics, edit, got some other stuff going on here. So I'm going to get rid of it. And I'm just going to put in the simple list of 15 people in order zero, one, one, two, three, four, 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 three, fours, five, five, nine, 10, 10, 14, and 20. Uh, somehow I'm missing because I did this five nine thing bad. Five nine. Then 10, 10, 14, and 20. Okay, there's 15 people. Let's do the statistics on this. Calculate one variable statistics. There's no frequency list here. I just put in the repeats. Get rid of the frequency list. Calculate. And on my paper, I'm going to write that the mean was 6.13, and the standard deviation was 5.514, relatively large. Now let's go back to my paper. There, I'm on my paper right now. Excuse me. I got to find my paper in front of me on the screen. I've lost my paper. There it is. Okay. So what's my error bound going to be? 6.13 minus error bound? 6.13 plus error bound. I'll just finish this so I can keep this in the recording. What's the error bound going to be? It's going to be the T alpha over 2 value and the standard deviation S over square root of n. The square root of n is the square root of 15. The s was the 5.514. But this t alpha, now remember, I want 98% confidence. So in my distribution, I want 1% right here. One percent, remember, is 0 0.01. What's my degrees of freedom, by the way? 14. So let's figure out what this is in the inverse t distribution. I'm going to just use my calculator in front of you. Four, area. I want 99% to be to the left. Degrees of freedom was 14. And let's calculate. 2.62. Four five. 2.6245. Now I'm going to multiply by the standard deviation and divide by the square root of 15. So times 5.514 divided by square root of 15. And this will give me my error bound 3.73. Six, three point seven three seven. That's relatively good for an error bound. I believe that 
the average student is 6.13 minus that number. What's that? 2.39 hours of television. Let's call it 2.39 hours of television up to 6.13 plus that number. I realize, sorry, I realize I'm hurrying too much on this. You gotta put a plus sign in there. 9.87 hours of television. You say, I'm not very impressed. That's not a very good estimate, but remember how things sound backwards. That might be pretty wide, right? But because that's relatively wide, I have a high confidence. I am 98% confident that that interval should represent somewhere in it possibly the true number of hours students watch television a week. And remember, I said that only by interviewing 15 students. Okay, yeah, 15 students is not large. That's why this number is so broad. And I'm looking for super high chance of winning, 98%. That's another reason why this number is so broad, this interval is so broad. You might want a tighter interval, you think, yeah? Well, you might want a tighter interval, but then you won't be as confident in it. So I'm relatively happy with this interval. I could say it like this, I'm 98% confident that students, most students watch, the average number of hours students watch television less than 10 hours a week. Okay, that's reasonable. Okay, this was called student's T distribution that I used right there. I'm gonna to have to hang it up now and uh, thank you for hanging around or thank you for patiently listening to the recording. That we'll do some more examples of this next time. So you have a good day. And I'll get this recording posted and these notes posted. Thank you, I'll see you later.